Hi everyone, welcome to the Introduction to Investments. In this first week's worth of videos, I thought it'd be good to do a couple of things. First, walk you through the basics, and then talk about some of the most important concepts that we will be discussing throughout this semester. This first set of videos is going to be broken down into four parts. So this video, I'm going to welcome you to the course, talk about some of the stuff that you should already know coming into this course. In our second video, I'll discuss careers in finance, specifically in investments and financial planning. Then in our third video, I'll talk about the basic asset classes. And then finally, in our fourth video, I'll talk about the investment policy statement and the life cycle, which are very important in finance. Okay, so let's get started. What should you know coming into an Introduction to Investments course, or our class Finance 310? Well, you should know some basic definitions, obviously. So first off, an investment is any asset into which funds can be placed with the expectation that they'll generate positive income and or increase in value. Uh, this could include shares of stock, bonds, a piece of rental property, or even a painting, if you're holding it with the expectation that it'll increase in value or generate positive income. A portfolio is just a collection of different investments. It could be two stocks, or a painting and a bond, or 30 different stocks. Uh, any of these would be portfolios. Diversification occurs when you hold different types of assets in a portfolio. You can diversify across stocks and bonds, diversify across different types of real estate. You can diversify uh, geographically or using assets that have different time horizons. Uh, essentially, there's many ways to diversify a portfolio. And finally, a return on your investment is your reward for investing. There's two ways to generate a return. Uh, first, you can just generate income on your investment. Uh, so for example, if you're holding long-term bonds, uh, these will likely pay you coupon payments. If you own a piece of rental property, you should hopefully receive rental income from your tenants. If you sell either of these assets for more than you bought them, for, then you're said to have earned capital appreciation. In other words, the value of your assets increased during the holding period. When your assets decrease in value during the holding period, uh, that's typically referred to as capital depreciation. We often break down assets into securities and property. Now, securities are financial assets. They provide their owner the claim on specific real assets or financial assets. However, you can't touch a security. Property, on the other hand, is a real asset, meaning it that it's tangible. You can touch it. Real estate, a piece of equipment or a car, these are all re real assets. They're physical. One big issue with property and other types of real assets, though, is a lack of liquidity. They're hard to sell at a fair value. Now, liquidity is an incredibly important topic in investments. Liquidity we typically define as the ability to buy and sell quickly at a fair value. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say you need to sell a house this week and you know the fair value of the house is $200,000. However, there aren't that many people who are able to buy your house within one week. Therefore, you might have to sell your house at a discount in order to make the transaction happen. This would be a perfect example of an illiquid market for your house. As a counter example, let's say you own shares of Apple stock and you wanna sell them in the next minute. The current fair value of Apple stock, let's say it's $300, and to sell your shares, you would need to sell them for $299.95. You could do that. Apple stock is a security that is incredibly liquid. The next definitions that we have are direct and indirect investments. Direct investments are investments that are made by an investor themselves. So for example, if I bought 100 shares of Ford stock, this would be a direct investment. However, if I buy shares in a, in a mutual fund that buys up 100 shares of Ford stock, and then I hold the fund's portfolio, those shares in the portfolio would be an indirect investment in Ford stock. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. Uh, throughout the semester, you'll see me ask a bunch of these CFA questions. These are questions that are very similar to questions you might see on the CFA level one exam. Uh, so if you do pretty well on these, if you know the answer to these, consider taking the CFA exams because I think you might do quite well. So let's start with a simple one. Which of the following is least likely a real asset? Currencies, commodities, or real estate? 
Well, the correct answer is currencies. And the reason currencies are least likely a real asset is because most currency, it's not physical. It, it trades electronically. Uh, whereas the other two, commodities, uh, real estate, you can touch those. You know, commodities are things like coffee or oil. You know, there's, there's, you can hold those, you can touch those. Uh, with currencies, yes, you have physical paper money or coins, but the overwhelming majority of currencies uh, are not are not tangible. Now let's talk about the individuals and organizations that you'll see in the investment marketplace. First, we have financial institutions. And financial institutions are organizations that pool capital or cash to invest it in assets. Some of the most common and most important financial institutions are insurance companies, banks, uh, so specifically commercial banks, savings banks, investment firms, and investment banks. Uh, insurance companies are financial institutions that receive the premiums of individuals or organizations they insure, combine that pool of money with cash they borrow, and then invest that capital in a portfolio of stocks, bonds, and other assets. Commercial banks are banks that receive deposits from individuals and organizations, and then they combine the those funds with cash that they borrow and then lend that money to companies in the form of loans and they also invest the rest of the money in stocks and bonds. Investment banks are banks that raise capital from deposits and borrowing. However, their primary activities have historically been helping firms and governments raise capital by issuing debt and equity. Investment banks charge these organizations that they help raise money for uh, fees for their services. Uh, typically, this is in the form of flotation costs. Now, investment companies is kind of a catch-all for investors that manage clients' monies. Uh, there's a huge number of firms that would classify as investment companies. These include mutual funds, hedge funds, pension funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds would also be included. Uh, this is kind of a grab bag definition. All right, next we need to talk about market participants. So, uh, when we talk about market participants, we do have a couple broad categories here. Uh, typically, investment companies are often referred to colloquially as institutional investors. So you'll hear me refer to institutional investors all the time in our course, practically every day that we're in class. And when I say that, what I really mean is any institution, any bank, insurance company, mutual fund that manages money on behalf of someone else. So uh, typically we have a breakdown between individual investors and institutional investors. Institutional investors are basically any non-governmental organization that manages money. If you or I were to invest shares of stock though, obviously we would be considered individual investors or households. Uh, there are a lot of other players out there. The big ones are gonna be uh, say like private equity investors, which admittedly these are kind of a, subs uh, a subset of institutional investors, but you should definitely know this definition. Uh, private equity investors typically, uh, these are investors that focus on investments in firms who are, whose shares are not publicly traded on a stock exchange. And there's two prominent types of private equity investors. We have venture capital firms and angel investors. Uh, venture, venture capital firms provide funding to new and private firms in exchange for shares of stock, and they often get a seat on the board. Angel investors are high net worth investors that often take an equity stake in a firm in exchange for funding. Uh, the best example of angel investors would be the sharks on the show Shark Tank. If you've ever seen that show, you know that there's a bunch of wealthy investors, including Mark Cuban, uh, who sit around listening to pitches by entrepreneurs. And these sharks, they ask uh, they they essentially make bids on how much they'll invest in exchange for ownership stake in the company, and they'll often provide some value in addition to the capital. So they might help sell the products of the company in their own stores or something like that. Now, the last two bullet points I have here are firms and governments. And firms and governments are big participants in the markets. So obviously they have a, uh, a need for capital. So Firms, they need to raise capital uh, that they use to invest in new capital budgeting projects. Governments, typically they need to borrow money to pay for any budget deficits that they have. Okay, 
So we do have a couple remaining definitions here. Uh, capital assets, these are typically assets owned by uh, organizations or taxpayers. These assets could include real estate or shares of stock. And a capital gain is typically the amount by which the proceeds for the sale of a capital asset are more than its original purchase price. So if you earned a profit from uh, purchasing an asset and then selling it, uh, you got a capital gain. Now, capital gains are taxed in a couple different ways depending on how long the taxpayer owned the asset. If you own the asset for less than one year, your capital gains are going to be taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. So whatever that uh, tax rate is in your tax bracket. If you own the capital asset and then sell it for a capital gain at least one year from now, then you're going to be subject to capital gains taxes. So those are typically 0% if uh, you are relatively low income, 15% uh, if you're moderate income, and then 20% beyond a certain income level. And then finally, we have a capital loss. And this typically just means that you bought an asset and then you sold it for less than you bought it. Uh, so capital losses, these can often be used to offset capital gains to a certain extent. Now, I hope I haven't bored you too much with all these definitions, uh, but before we wrap up, I did want to show you the business cycle or talk about the business cycle. Uh, the business cycle, it's kind of an archaic term, but it refers to this idea that economic conditions cycle through expansionary and contractionary periods in time. During expansionary periods in the business cycle, we typically see uh, increases in GDP, uh, increases in industrial production of goods, and increases in disposable income. We also expect that there will be a decrease in the unemployment rate. So in most time periods, we're in an expansionary period of the business cycle. During a uh, contractionary period, well, quite frankly, that's where we see increasing unemployment and uh, decreasing GDP growth. So typically we define contractionary periods or recessionary periods when there's two consecutive periods of negative GDP growth. Uh, so you know that would include the 2008 through 2010 period, uh, period right around uh, 2020. Uh, but yeah, if you want to see some of my favorite videos on the business cycle and why it exists, uh, two of my all-time favorite videos, just click these links. I you know, just a series of silly YouTube videos. Okay, now the last thing I wanted to touch on this in this video is what are we going to talk about in the rest of this course? So there's this old public speaking rule where you tell the audience what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then reinforce what you told them. So you tell them three times. So basically, uh, I'm going to front run the big concepts in this course now, and then I'm going to talk about them throughout the course. And then when we get to the end of the course, I'm going to summarize what we covered. So let's get started. First off, markets are somewhat efficient. Uh, quite frankly, you've, you've already had a class in finance, so hopefully you know the concept of efficient markets. Uh, well, in this class, you're going to see evidence that in the U.S. and developed markets, the valuation of assets like stocks and bonds typically adjust very quickly based on new information. This is the basic idea behind market efficiency. Prices adjust based on all relevant information. In other words, a share of a stock's value should be based on all available information we have to price the stock's future cash flows discounted to the present. Next, you're going to see in this class that there are a couple of different types of risk. Uh, we'll talk about two main types of risk in the middle of the class, specifically market risk and firm-specific risk. Now, market risk is the risk that affects all securities in, a, in an economy. For example, a coronavirus outbreak will affect all stocks in the U.S. Uh, how that coronavirus outbreak affects stocks will depend on many factors, but one of the most important of these factors is the amount of market risk that they're exposed to. For example, firms like airlines are known to carry a large amount of market risk. You know, Typically, if everyone has to shut down, airlines are going to be hurt more than, say, uh, online sellers of food. Uh, so they're going to have a much more significant negative impact, or there's going to be more negative impact for these firms because there's more market risk associated with them. Next, 
you're going to see a positive relationship between market risk and return. Uh, in other words, what you're going to see throughout this course is that the more market risk that you as an investor are exposed to, or a stock is exposed to, the higher the return should be for that stock. And we'll talk about why that is in this class, but basically you're taking on more risk that you can't diversify away. So you should be compensated more highly. So uh, investments in say tech companies or uh, specifically high beta stocks or stocks that uh, do really well when you know, market conditions are good and really bad when market conditions are bad. These are historically companies that should outperform other companies. And finally, diversification is key. Now, diversification, this is everything in portfolio management. We are expected as portfolio managers to diversify as much as possible to reduce a specific type of risk, the firm specific risk. Uh, basically, diversification reduces the volatility of our portfolio. And that's why we build these, these portfolios containing 30, 50, 200 different securities. Uh, I'm going to try and harp that into you as much as possible throughout this course. Okay, so let's summarize what we talked about. Investment professionals have to consider the characteristics of each investment, and we have a bunch of different definitions that they, they have to consider. Uh, we'll talk about each of these definitions going forward in this class. Uh, liquid markets are good at pricing in new information, so liquid assets like stocks are typically very appropriately priced, whereas illiquid assets like real estate, uh, they're, they might be priced at a discount. And then finally, we talked about some very important themes like diversification. Uh, diversification is key to building a portfolio, and we'll talk about you know why that is, but basically it reduces volatility while still maintaining a decent return. So we'll see all of these concepts later in this course. Uh, so there it is. I'll end this video, and I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.